Welcome to the second part in our series on CICD. I'm Suri and I work on the content team here at GitLab. We're thrilled you're joining us to learn how to make your DevOps dreams a reality. If you have questions during the presentation, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We'll also dedicate some time to answer your questions at the end of the presentation. If you have any technical difficulties, please use the chat function and I will do my best to help you. Today, John Jeremiah, a senior product marketing manager, will help us solve the collaboration conundrum. So let's get started. Hello, John. Hi, Suri. Thank you so much. And you know, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Yeah, I'm super excited to be here with you today and to talk about you know, what we're facing and, and to continue the conversation we started a few weeks ago when Victor talked about DevOps and some of the challenges people were facing. And, and I want to focus really today on, on what we're facing. I want to talk about the challenges people are running into, building on what Victor shared, and, and look at what are some of the blockers and barriers and, and why are people running into those, those challenges? And then how can you break down the barriers? How can you move forward? So let's get started and, and take a look first at the reality, right? And, and if you remember what we talked about, Victor talked about the reality that a lot of people are facing when they look at DevOps. People are investing an enormous amount of energy and resources to try to transform the way they deliver software. They're spending literally millions and millions, even billions of dollars to try to improve the way they deliver software. But in, in many cases, the results they're feeling, what they're experiencing isn't, isn't what they wanted. They're not getting the ability to go faster. And in fact, a lot of times people are reporting that they're disappointed with the results. And if, if you think about why and you look for why, you're going to find some really interesting observations. You know, a couple of observations I found when I started to look at why do people struggle with DevOps is, you know, if, if we looked at, you know, stories that people have written, two of, two of them that came to mind that I saw re that really resonated. You know, Tech Beacon, they wrote a great story recently about what are the reasons why people fail with DevOps? What are reasons that drive it? One of them was, well, they create a DevOps department, like another silo to try to do DevOps when the whole goal is to try to build collaboration across the board. Same, same finding, actually, interestingly, came out of, of an article on Dzone. They, they look at, you know, not thinking about capacity and workload, not appreciating the real challenges that people are facing. And, and they're bringing DevOps in without changing the way they work. I, I loved how DZone talked about, you know, how it's not just a set of tools, but it's changing the culture. And it's changing a culture that is inclusive of everyone who's involved in de developing and delivering software. It's not just the devs and the ops. It's quality, it's security, it's the business owner. You know, one of the hardest things is getting business owners to engage and be part of these delivery life cycle. I experienced it myself introducing Agile into an organization where they thought all they had to do is write the requirements and then come back in six months for what was done. Business owners have to change too. And, and it's one of these changes, it's one of these transformations that it can't be mandated from leadership. Leadership has to embrace it and support it, but it also has to be something that developers and engineers and security professionals and ops teams have to embrace and want to change too. This is a change of the culture in the organization that only happens if we all start to change the way we work. You can't just buy a tool, you can't just say we're gonna do it. We have to really embrace and embark on a different way of leading and a different way of thinking about how we deliver software. And, and if you look at and think about the traditional world, the traditional enterprise IT organization of how we've evolved over the years, you know, I've, I've often, I've written about this, about how it's called tribes, you know, the different tribes of IT, and, and, and a lot of times we call them silos. So, you know, silos works here, right? There's a group of people who work on planning and governance, and they have their tools and their language, and, and they work together to manage and optimize their portfolio. They come up with an idea, a plan, a new project, something that they, they're going to deliver. And, and a team of, is formed and they go off and start building it. Sometimes in isolation with the people who are going to test it and make sure it, it's good and ready to go. 
I know in my past history, it was often in isolation. And one of the biggest challenges was how do you get these teams to work together and not be at odds with each other? And, and then when you get done, well, how do you get it to production? I mean, this is what Patrick Dubois started to talk about when he talked about agile ops, which became DevOps not so many years ago. This is the la those barriers between development and operations, how operations could be more agile. But these barriers are in between the teams. Not only are they between the teams, but you know what? These barriers aren't just cultural. We built, too often we've built them into the way we work. And we've built them into the tools we buy and the language we use. We've created all of these different tools and then we've tried to solve the, the, this barrier with, well, we, we try to wire them together. And, and then we run into problems because we have different data models. We have different definitions of, of different elements. We often find ourselves in conflict and then having to maintain all of these different tools is how they integrate with each other. When one changes, we have to work on managing and maintaining it. And, and it becomes a huge overhead for organizations to keep track of and for teams to keep track of. And, and at the end of the day, the business really doesn't care about how the tools work or how they connect with each other. The business cares about delivering value at the end. How we do it, how we deliver value, they don't care. They really want us to go faster and deliver value. And, and so what, what we really end up with is, is the, you know, some very real challenges and some very real issues that this model introduces. We don't have any real sense of visibility end to end. We can pull it together with dashboards and, and reports and put it into PowerPoint or slides or different ways to show it to leaders, but it's hard. It's incredibly hard to have a clear view of status on what, what is where and to understand the status but where we're going. It's certainly not efficient. It's not a process or a framework that says, oh wow, we're gonna be able to just let it run and focus on, on resolving issues and delivering new value and new innovation. And, and frankly, the other part about it, the other challenge we often run into is the one that our auditors and security teams, and they expect to have some degree of control. When you have to go through an audit to demonstrate compliance with COVID or SOX, and you have to be able to demonstrate that you're following the process and the controls that you set are in place are there, and that people, that they work. In the old way, in the way with all the different tools and the way we were traditional, it can be really hard. Because a lot of times people are gonna find the shortest way to get things done, to be efficient. And, and that often makes it hard when it comes time to audit and prove that you actually delivered and followed the process. So these sources of friction, these sources of challenges and pain points, can, can be really a problem. And, and frankly, when you look at it from a tool chain perspective, and you say, okay, well, it's, it's not really that bad because I'm just managing, you know, we have one or two projects and it's fairly simple and our tool chains are simple and they're, they're defined and we can deal with it, right? You, you, you say that. And then the question would be is, you know, is it not perhaps a bigger problem? Because if you think forward, think about where we're going. Think about the future of cloud native and how we're going to see more and more microservices and smaller, more granular applications. Think about how more and more teams are gonna have be involved in building and developing and delivering smaller pieces of solutions. It's gonna to lead to a multiplication of tool chains and it's only going to get harder. It's not gonna get easier. You might even consider it a tool chain crisis that is that we're on the precipice that this is going to become much much harder as we go forward and you have to solve this you have to think about how do you optimize your tool chain in order to be faster and more efficient and if you want to move at the speed of business if you want to accelerate and go as fast as the business wants you to go then we have to figure out how do we collaborate how do we bring teams together to interact with each other, to have one common view, to share their goals and to share their vision. Now, a lot of times, you know, it started, frankly, you know, it started probably 15 years ago, give or take, when we introduced and we saw people start to adopt Agile. 
Agile really was focused on lowering the barriers between these core teams. It was about how do we get developers and QA and project managers to work iteratively and to focus on, on having visibility on what they're doing and to work more collaboratively with each other. And I'd argue that Agile has helped these teams to be much, much more efficient. And, and when Patrick and Gene and Jez and John Willis and the guys who have been thought leaders behind the DevOps transformation, the world of DevOps, what they've started to force us to think about is then how do you go on and how do you start to lower these other barriers? How do you enable automation and collaboration and sharing and measurement? How do you bring those principles of lean manufacturing to lower the barriers? to enable teams to collaborate and communicate more consistently from place, from part to part. So they're not thinking about their silos, but they're really focusing on how do they respond to the business demand for value, the business demand for innovation. This is the key. And that's why we do what we do. All of us, we come to work every day and we focus on building and delivering great software. It's not about managing the tool chain. It's about supporting the business. And in the old way of working, the old way of doing this, we were always often got stuck on thinking about sequentially, about from one handoff to another, going from silo to silo to silo. And as you think about these handoffs, what, what does it do? It introduces friction. There's all these opportunities for waiting. You know, if you in a lean mindset, you want to eliminate wake, work in progress. You want to eliminate and reduce your constraints so you can go faster. But if you get locked into this siloed mindset of handoffs, it, it only leads to friction and finger pointing and challenges. But when you're able to work collaboratively and you're able to share and have visibility across the full life cycle, you can start to think about how can I go concurrently? How can I free it up so that we can have multiple builds a day and we can have teams working on multiple issues in parallel? And, and we're no longer constrained by the silos and our lack of visibility, but we're really able to move at a much, much faster pace. It's, it's frankly a, a liberating mindset to be able to think about working together collaboratively across the full life cycle, rather than having to wait and wait and wait, because that's what the business is doing. And, and your competitors are not waiting. You have to figure out how to go faster, and this is a key to doing it and a key to going faster. So let's go back and look at that tool chain for a second, right? This is what so many of you are experiencing every day. One version, one variation of these tools or another impacts the way you deliver. Now, if we wanna look at what does the answer look like? How do you solve this? Well, you know, one of the ways you solve it is it's cultural, right? It's about getting teams to work together. It's about aligning goals and KPIs and aligning so that people can work together collaboratively, but it's also about removing some of those barriers, removing some of those roadblocks. So that way people can work together faster. So they can have a common view and a common discussion that the team is able to unify behind. It's about having a single source of truth where you can really have traceability and visibility across the life cycle. It's really about how do you streamline the processes and enable teams to work in a way that they're more efficient. Now, you know, the, I have the term left shift in here or shift left, but it's relevant. How, long, how often do we wait till late in the life cycle to either do security testing or some version of performance testing only to discover that we have a problem that's gonna impact our ability to ship? or we're gonna ship it and it's gonna impact the value the customer experiences. And I don't know about the rest of you, but I know that we're make those decisions you have to make all the time. And a lot of times you don't have to do that. If you can identify performance and security issues as soon as they happen, as soon as they are introduced into the code, you have a chance of fixing it. So being able to shift left, is an important capability and it's important to think about how do you help people do that? And then at the end of the day, you have to have a, a system and a, pl a platform and a framework in place that allows you to manage and govern the work. 
where it's not out of control, where it's really quite controlled. You know, in fact, I, I wrote a piece about how mature DevOps is actually produces higher quality and more reliable solutions than it does if you work in a tr more traditional waterfallish way. Uh, I wrote about Gartner's bimodal model once, and I, th I think they, they get it wrong because it's really about how do we work together and how do we collaborate with shift left automation and testing to ensure that we're always delivering quality. If we do this right, if you do this right, you're gonna have more control and more compliance and better governance than you ever would before. And, and while you do it, you end up reducing risk and delivering higher value. Now, I, I wanna share a little bit of how we do this, right? This is something we do we're doing this, right? This is not something that is theoretical and oh, you might be able to do it. This is something that's for real. I mean, this is something we, we're actually doing. Not only are we doing it because we're as transparent as we are, you could actually check out our single discussion at GitLab because what we've done is we've brought our entire DevOps lifecycle into one view where we really do maintain a single conversation from planning future features and issues to how we go ahead and then start to create the merge requests and code, to how we build testing and security testing into the pipeline. So everything gets built, every, every commit gets tested. It all gets moved through to consistently packaging, releasing, and configuring. See, really what we're doing and what we're demonstrating, what we're doing as a team here at GitLab is we're building around a single conversation a single conversation that helps us focus on delivering value and iterating at, at a remarkable speed. And because of what we're doing, because of the me mechanics of what we're doing and the way we're working as a culture and as one team, we're able to deliver amazing value. And, and this is what we've experienced. And it's, I think it's something you should look at, how do you do it for your team? Whether, whether it's a combination of tools that you work to streamline around, or how do you bring your teams together to collaborate and deliver faster than ever? Uh, a couple of closing comments and a couple of closing thoughts as we kind of get to the end so we can take some questions uh, is, you know, and, and I want to reiterate what, what Victor had said earlier. And because in, in, in his presentation, I think he got it right, and I think it's still true. I think at the end of the day, what we're talking about is a cultural transformation a transformation in which involves how your people, how the people on the teams, the different tribes, how they work together, how they build trust and a relationship with each other, how they learn that it's okay to experiment and to start to take risks and to learn together, and, and how they embrace a process and a framework that enables them to embark on continuous improvement. How do they continue to improve their process? Because at the end of the day, your DevOps journey really is one that it starts with the first step of committing to continuous improvement. And I'm not sure exactly where it ends because the business will always want faster release. They will always, they will start to consume the speed that you're able to give them. And the tools are an incredibly important part. They're enablers. The more the tools that you use can communicate and integrate together, the more seamless they come together, the lower the friction, the, the more you can reduce the friction and accelerate delivery. So it's, it's an exciting time, frankly, and it's one that I have some time, I think, for questions. Uh, Dan is with us. He's gonna, been fielding questions as well as we're going. Uh, Dan, do we have any questions in the uh, question that, that I could take? I actually have a question here for you, John. Uh, okay, sir. Someone wrote in and asked, what is the role of executives in a DevOps transformation? Great question. Uh, you know, I, uh, I've, I've spoken to executives. I've, I, I think the, about this, and I think that the role, I think executives are an incredibly important part of this. Uh, executives, you know, while they may not be in the weeds and writing code and working on the details of what, how things happen. Executives set the tone. You see, executives set the goals and the KPIs for an organization. And so if you imagine an executive who tells, a CIO who tells her VP of ops, I want no more outages. Okay, 
great. The VP of Ops is going to execute on that KPI, on that goal. And, and they're going to implement a set of processes and practices to make it really, really hard to make changes because they know that changes lead to outages. And so the CIO is in, in effect, basically through that goal, told the VP of Ops, don't you dare you know, make it easy to release or easy to deploy because that might lead to outages. The unintended consequence of simple KPIs can often have a huge impact. So I think executives have to appreciate how the culture of DevOps is different and how thinking end to end and, and distributing the responsibility for having systems up can help people to work more efficiently and collaboratively. Yeah, I think executives are incredibly important. Uh, at, at HP, I worked with a CIO named Ralph Laura. And Ralph, I, I, I really loved what Ralph said. And he presented a DevOps Enterprise Summit in 2015. And he said, my job is to provide the buoys for the team to follow, not the boundaries. And, and, and Ralph's idea was, you know, I need to give them general direction as to what the goals are and where to go. But the exact path they take, they need to find their way. And it was about empowering teams to be successful. And, and I thought Ralph was, his insight as a, as a leader as to how to lead this, I thought was, was spot on. Other questions? We have a question here. Where should teams get started on DevOps? Do you have any high level advice? <laughs> I had, that's a great question. And I love that question because I, I A, I get it a lot. Uh, I, I actually get a similar question. I had another, somebody else had asked me, what's the best tool for DevOps? And, and, and the, the, that separate question, I'll, I'll, and the answer to the tool, the, the number one tool you have to have for DevOps is the one on top of your shoulders. It's about how you think about changing the culture in the sense that you have to think first and not just start with, well, let's go buy tools. But where do you get started? And, and this is another very relevant. I had a conversation with Gary Groover, who wrote a book about starting and scaling of DevOps in the enterprise. And I asked Gary this, exactly this question. I said, Gary, where do people get started? And Gary's answer is, and Gary's a kind of a consultant in this role in this part of his life. He gave me a consultant's answer was, it depends. And, and I tend to agree with Gary at some level, is that it really depends on what's your scope of, of responsibility. If you're a development leader, if you're a dev, if you're managing a team of developers, or you're a, or you're a developer, well, your scope of influence is is you need to look at where can you influence. So that's one one thing that it depends on. If you're a CIO, well, you've got influence across the whole life cycle. Then 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 the answer is, and the answer for anyone really is, look at your flow. Look at your pipeline, the flow of what it takes for an, the value stream for what it takes for an idea to go through the development process to production. And, and then in the spirit of lean manufacturing, in the spirit of thinking about, you know, end to end and Kaizen, where is the biggest pain point and bottleneck in your process? Is it testing? Is it test environments? Is it, you know, perhaps release management? In, in your scope and in your end to end process of what you can control, start to improve and remove those constraints. And, and that's really, that should be one of the guidelines as to where do you get started. Now, I think there's some couple of common patterns about how people get started. I think there's a pattern where people start to work on improving source control and improving their development processes with automated builds and automated testing. That's a common theme that we see people start there. We also see people, I've seen people start with, you know, I'm going to work on, you know, on releases and release automation. We have problems with all of our releases. We get, we lose control of our environments. And, you know, Kurt Bittner, who used to be a forest journalist, he's, I think he's now at the Scrum Alliance. His, his advice to some companies and to customers was start with production and work your way backwards. Start with making sure you can consistently deploy and automate deploys to production and work your way backwards. So I think the answer, it's, un, it's unsatisfying, is that it does depend on the organization and it depends on who's trying to drive the change. It depends on where the pain points are. And, and the, the, real, the truth is, anywhere you start, you're going to end up touching the whole life cycle. And as soon as you start, I would argue you're doing DevOps because now you're focusing on improving your flow and improving your velocity. And, and that process of continuous improvement will just build on each other and it'll snowball over time. Thank you so much for answering that, John. 
and we have one here about tools. Focus on tools was listed as a reason for DevOps failure. Aren't you selling a tool? Yeah, I am. Uh, and, and I'm going to say this because I've been this person, but you know, the term I used that I described myself in a past life was I was a fool with a tool. I thought buying a tool would change the culture of my organization. And we bought and tried to implement a portfolio management tool in an organization that wasn't really ready. The cultural change, the people weren't ready to change. And, and, and so, so much as we wanted the tool to drive the change, at the end of the day, the hard work of change management, of organizational change management, was work that, you know, our leaders weren't prepared to go as far and to push as hard. And so as from a mid-level, we tried to push a change in the organization. The organization wasn't really ready for. And, and so the tool by itself does not get you, will not necessarily get you the results. In only a few isolated situations will buying a tool just magically solve a problem. Ultimately, it's how you use and how you deploy and use a tool will, will drive the results. There's a great example of, there was a blog post that James Shore wrote 12 years ago, 15 years ago. And, and he, he described how to do, continue, the blog post, you can Google it, I, we can put it a link in. But the, the, the post was how to do continuous integration for a dollar a day. I think it was a dollar a day. And he described in that post how to use a rubber chicken and a bell for a team to enable a team to do continuous integration. And, and the point is, it wasn't about the tool, it was about the process. It was about how the developers use the chicken to determine who was building at a given point in time and how the bell was a signal for the other developers to realize that there was a new version on the build machine that they needed to go pull down and get, a, uh, get an update of, of the code they're working on so they could continuously integrate. It's a great post and it's one I've used in the past. So it's not, the point is, it's the people and process as much as it is the tool. And, and absolutely, uh, GitLab's, GitLab's single application to address the entire life cycle is, is frankly pretty darn cool. But the tool alone won't do it for you. The tool alone can enable you. If you're committed to making the change and moving in that direction, tools can be a huge enabler and can help accelerate that journey though. So that I, would, I would leave with that. That's my putting my vendor pitch hat on just for a moment. And so speaking of people, we have a question here. How can you build trust between teams so that rather than having one team hassle the other for an output, they can trust that something will be delivered? Boy, that's a tough question. So part of building trust is being transparent. Part of building trust is, is showing up with the other team and being transparent about where, what your priorities are and what you're trying to achieve. And, and being transparent about how you're going to engage and work with others. I think one of the characteristics that helps to build trust is tra just, just organizational transparency between the leaders of those teams and the, the people working on those teams. If you don't believe that they're doing what they're going to do or saying what, if, if they say one thing and you don't think that's really who they are, or what they're doing, that, that erodes trust, right? That hurts trust. Uh, one of the ways I think that DevOps in general, and the principles of what we're talking about when we look at DevOps helps to build trust is automation, right? You know, culture is part of DevOps, but as soon as we start to automate those things that are important, you know, you start to trust the pipeline to, to tell you what where things are at. And when you have those issues between teams of dependencies on other teams, I would suggest one of the strategies is to ask yourself the question, is this something we could automate? Is this something we could work together to automate, whether it's performance testing or whether it's user acceptance testing or whether it's compliance with certain requirements from a documentation and auditability perspective or whether it's security? A lot of times the reason the trust isn't there is because we've eroded it over time. But if we can build into our development life cycle, 
those handoffs, we can start to trust the pipeline too. And so I think there's an element of automation that can actually help to build trust because then we focus on, well, how do we document, how do we automate this to make it repeatable? And how do we make it so that way, as we learn together, we then improve what we've put into our pipeline. Our automation improves to reflect our knowledge. I think about when I joined GitLab a couple months ago, you know, I, I was updating one of our websites and I broke, I broke something, which is good. Breaking things is good. But the, the output of the result of my mistake led to a new test that would now prevent me from making the same mistake again. And so we trust, it's about trusting the pipeline too. Great. And we have a question here. It says, I understand that culture is important to start with DevOps. How about the next step to technically collaborating as a team with a focus to achieve a solution? Yeah, I, 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 it's circular, frankly. I mean, it, it really is. It's, it's a circular journey in which the culture of sharing and collaboration works together to build trust and to focus. And, it, and when you start to think about this, I've seen this in a couple of situations and I know Gary does this when he runs workshops and I saw it when we did the, when we adopted DevOps at HP, you know, we, we brought together all of the leaders, all of the stakeholders into one room and they had a, and, and they kicked off the whole journey around a summit and, and they established some common definitions and common goals and they started to put into place what they called at the time. And if anybody wants it, I can find it or I can get it. I know people who have it. They created their own DevOps manifesto of the principles that, Defined DevOps for them. And, you know, you can have an opinion about whether the word manifesto is, might be overkill, but it was a set of working principles that they collectively agreed to sign up to and how they were going to work together. And that was a way that they, one, built culture, but it quickly led them to how do they start to collaborate technically to work together as a team to deliver soft, to deliver value. And, and as, as I see this, it's an iterative cycle. Gary likes to work his, his customers, when Gary Gruber does his work, he likes to get them into a one month rhythm of one month, we're gonna improve something. What are we gonna improve this month? And it becomes a cadence of every single month they're working on improving how they deliver while also working on delivery. And, and so I, I, can't, I, I can't recommend Gary's book strongly enough. I think he offers great insight as to how to do it practically. He's not a, it's not a technical book, it's a practical leadership book. Uh, and so if anybody would like that, I can, you know, either tweet it, tweet at me or ping me on, get, ping me somehow, ping me. I didn't put my contact info in here. I probably should have, but, uh, ping, contact us and let us know. And I'll, I'll be glad to connect anybody with Gary or figure out how to get you inside the Gary into what Gary does. So speaking of practical tips, we have a question when working in a waterfall style organization. What kind of conversations are good starters to help executives see the change you want to introduce? Tough question. I think the conversation with executives. So the, here's, gosh, it was a quote. And I'm going to say the quote. I'll get the guy's title wrong. I just don't have it in front of me. But this is the chairman of the World Bank in Geneva, World Bank Economic Forum. And he said it about three years ago. He said, the world is no longer a world in which the big fish eat the small fish. It's now a world where the fast fish will be eating the slow fish. And, and, and you know what? If, if you're in an organization and the mode of development being waterfall oriented, and you know what? I, waterfall works. If you know all your requirements and if you know exactly what it is you're gonna build and nothing is changing, you know, and it's, it's a stable, static environment. If I'm building a bridge, building a house, waterfall is pretty good. I mean, I, the laws of physics don't change. Concrete doesn't change. Things, things are pretty set. And if my world is what is one in which my environment is one, in which that's what it is, then, you know, maybe that is, that's good enough. And maybe there isn't pressure in the industry to go faster. Maybe there isn't the driver to do this. Although I would argue from an executive perspective, and I have argued this, that every single industry, Mark Andreessen's quote, 
from 2011, I think, that software is eating the world is, is, is spot on. You know, taxi companies aren't software companies. Tell that to Uber. Hotels have nothing to do with software. Tell that to Airbnb. And, and I would argue that every single company has a component that's digital and has a component that defines how they relate either with their customers or their, you know, if you're a government agency, your citizens, or if you're just B2B, your partners. It's digital. We, we establish and maintain relationships and we deliver value through a, a digital relationship often first and often and sometimes only. And, and so from an, my conversation with an executive is going to be, who's, who, you know, where is your, in, where's your disruption? Because it's out there. It, you know, somewhere in a garage, you know, there, there's a, there, there is someone in Kiev in a garage inventing a new solution or, or looking at a problem who says, I want to change this. And if they're not in Kiev, they're in Johannesburg or they're in Silicon Valley. And, and they're thinking about how they could take the combination of ubiquitous computing on the cloud, whether it's AWS or GCP or, or Azure, of, of they can spin it up on the cloud in, in moments. They can deploy it to, to you know, these, these supercomputers that they're in our pocket that we call phones. And, and they can, and all of a sudden, your, you know, you know, your Home Depot, a hardware company, and now all of a sudden there's this disruption that emerges because someone has come up with a better way to, to get hardware supplies to you know, the, their users. And so rather than going into Home Depot and wandering around the aisles looking for the right tool or the right hammer or the right you know, nuts or bolts, I can get it on my phone. I mean, it, it's, not, it's not out of the scope of imagination. And so my conversation with an executive would be to try to help them understand how, one, that disruption's coming. And that if your waterfall world has you releasing every quarter or every, you know, say, say you're going fast in your quarter, doing a quarter release, ask them what would happen if there was a competitor that was, you know, forcing that, you know, pushing new changes in innovation that, that was coming out every month. And, and, and before long, they're going to realize that if they can't move faster than their competition and they start to lose market share, they're going to have to change. And so that's one. I think the other part of it is an education for executives. A lot of times, and, and I went on this personal education myself, and, and to be, just to be transparent, I used to think this, this DevOps stuff was crazy thinking. That we're gonna automate all of this and we're gonna have people pushing code to production that fast. It's crazy, that won't work. You know, I, I came from an ITIL background. I thought from ITIL and sort of a traditional waterfall background myself. But it was once I realized that the power of what we're doing here is based on the principles of lean manufacturing and the principles of continuous improvement and automating all of the things we do such that when I make a change, any change, it's going through tens of thousands of automated tests to an, and security scans and checks and that everything is being validated to make sure that my change isn't is, is, is a good, is not going to break something. And if it does, then it doesn't go. So what we achieve with DevOps is higher security, higher availability, better quality, lower risk. These are all the things executives want. But you got to get past the mindset that has led them to think that the barriers and the silos of the past somehow gave them better reliability or better availability. And I would, I would frankly argue that the traditional way of putting in all the processes and the checks actually makes it harder to deliver with confidence. But that's a, that's a whole separate conversation. Thanks, John. We have a question about mindset. How do you help people shift their mindset from just thinking about something to taking real action to start the journey on actually building it? <laughs> uh, I, I, I kind of wonder where that question came from because it, I would suggest that you look at our handbook and our core values of iteration. And you know, at GitLab, one of the things we, we, we really, really embrace, and, we, we, and, and I would suggest that we, we are 
we, we're probably at the forefront of doing this, which is iteration, of what's the minimum viable change you can do to move forward. And think about, you know, when you have the idea or the mindset of, oh, we want to go in this direction, what's the smallest change? What's the smallest valuable step you can take in that direction without having to have the whole answer? And, and I think the opportunity for people to think differently is to look at, you know, if, if I want to change, I'll, I'll use an example of, that, that, that's relevant for me right now is I've been working on trying to define and articulate kind of a maturity model or maturity framework for how people adopt DevOps. And it serves a couple of reasons. And so I, I've discovered a, a model Ticketmaster built, which I, I think is brilliant. And, and so I'm applying this idea of minimum change. What's the smallest change I can do to refer to or to reference or to start to do that? And so I'm, I'm in my head building out what are, the, what are the steps I need to take to either build consensus or to make changes that help us to go in that direction. And so there's a couple of sides to it. One side of it is you know, I think you have to at least communicate and build consensus and, and get there's a collaboration part of it before, you take, before I take action. I like to at least make sure that you know, we've thought it through and I understand other, other issues and pitfalls and have we done this before. But once you've done some of that, then, then let's start going. And, and it's small changes. And, and you know, it's, it's about the power of small changes on our organization. You don't have to have, you don't have to boil the ocean. You don't have to know what the full DevOps lifecycle is going to look like in order to take one step and automate, you know, and either look at, you know, how do I start to automate testing more to do testing more consistently and effectively? You know, one step, how do I do builds more consistently? One step is what it takes to start that. And, and you don't try to solve world hunger, one, it's one bite at a time. I like that. You solve world hunger one bite at a time. And, and, and really the case here is you gotta take one bite at a time at how you're gonna do this. And, and be open to, be open to the reality that where you thought you were going when you started your journey, maybe you may end up somewhere different because you get 10 or 15 steps into this journey and you realize that there's a better alternative than what you thought you were doing at the beginning. So you, you have to be open to that evolution as well. But by taking small steps, you're moving further along the journey. And, and that's the key. It's to get moving. Don't get stuck talking about it. Start doing it. Thank you so much, John. We have one last question here. How do I know when I'm done with the DevOps transformation? Well, that's, a, that, that's actually, I think, an easy question because I don't think you ever are done. I mean, so you know you're done. You know you're done when the business says to you, they call you up on the phone and say, you know what, uh, don't go any faster, this is fast enough. When the business calls up and says, you know what, you, you, your shit, you know, what you're delivering is, is super fine value, we don't need any better, there's no competition, we're, you know, we don't need it anymore. And, and, and I think that will never happen. I've never known, uh, if you want to talk about unicorns, the unicorn I've never seen is a business leader who said, I love our IT shop. They're great. They deliver on time and they're efficient and fast. That's the unicorn that doesn't exist out there. At the end of the day, business, the business leaders that I've worked with demand, demand that IT go faster, that IT deliver faster solutions and are more responsive to their needs. They've all been frustrated with the long, the long, Gantt charts and the delays it's going to take to ship stuff and the fact that they don't get what they want. So I, I believe you're never going to reach that point where the business is going to look at you across the table and say, you know, thank you. I think you guys are awesome. You don't need to go any faster. I believe that as soon as you give them a taste of faster, they will want more. They don't know it today. But as soon as you give them a taste of what it's like to be able to get an idea 
out of their head and into production in three months. Say you're at six months today, you're doing it every six months, which I don't think many people are, but let's say you are, and you get them to three months. They'll consume that, and then they'll want you to go in two months or one. And they will be, they, they, they're going to, they're going to need it because the market is incredibly fast and the competition is fierce. So you're never done. Simple answer. You're never going to be really done. It's continuous improvement. And, and the spirit of Kaizen is really what it's all about. It's about improving and going faster and delivering higher quality and delivering more value. That's what we're, that's what this is all about. So, but yeah, and I'm excited. This is, this is exciting times. I don't know. Thank if you, can you so much, John. And thank you all for joining us. We hope you feel ready to adopt a DevOps model. If you'd like to learn more, please visit about.gitlab.com. We hope that you'll join us for the third part in our series in which we explore ways to use CICD to remove barriers between development and operations teams. Thank you again. We hope you have a nice rest of your week. Bye.